Thank you for your love and your grace, Father. And as we look at the uh, Olivet Discourse again uh, for the third week, Lord, we pray, Father, that this passage that we're, we're going to be reading about this morning, you, you've made it really clear that you want us to read it and to understand it, Father. And so we pray, God, that you give us wisdom on, on what it means and what it means to us today. And, and Father, might change our light and give us a desire to share your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bible to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. We're going to be picking up our study in verse 15. We're in our third week of what's called the Olivet Discourse. This is a teaching of Jesus, privately given to Peter, James, and John, and to uh, Peter's brother, Andrew. He's given it on the Mount of Olives, also known as the Mount Olivet. Therefore, it's called the Olivet Discourse. It's amazing, much of the world is very familiar about Jesus' first coming. If you said, what do you know about Jesus Christ? Well, he was, he was born in Bethlehem. I think he was born in a manger. Some wise men came and they brought some gifts. You know what I mean? Uh, he, he was a good teacher. I think there were shepherds that came at his birth. There was angels speaking to the shepherds. You know what I mean? They might understand. He died. He was crucified, I think. And, and I think he, he, you know, Christians say that he rose from the dead. And people have some understanding of what? The first coming of Jesus Christ. But regarding his second coming to earth, many Christians have no knowledge of what's going to be happening this morning. We're going to be helping to clarify that for you. You see, Jesus told these, his disciples that, that the temple is going to be destroyed. And in response to that, Matthew 24.3 said, tell us, when will these things be, the destruction of the temple? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And we talked about this before, that the disciples have their own end times belief, their own eschatology, because that's what eschatology is, a big word of what you believe is going to happen at the end of this world, you know, the end of this age as we know it today. And so he's helping them clarify that answering their questions. Understand, he's trying to answer their questions through his answer. They saw the destruction of the temple, Jesus coming at the end of the age, ushering in a reign of power and glory, and establishing the thousand-year millennium immediately. They saw it all happening quickly as one single uh, and quick uh, event. And over the past two weeks, Jesus clarified, hold on, there's going to be several things that are going to happen before the end of the age, before this happens. In fact, he said 10 things were going to happen. We talked about him two weeks ago, about five of the things. He told them that before his second coming to the earth, the end of the age, number one, there would be deception by false teachers. He said, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, declaring to be the Messiah and will deceive many. Note that. That was the very first thing he told them. And that is the one thing that affects his people's eternal salvation, is following false Christs. We're going to be talking about something called the abomination of desolation. And that has to do with, with, with the Antichrist, who's going to come as a false messiah, a false savior of the world. So put that one in your mind. He said that there's going to be dissension among nations, that they're going to hear wars and rumors of wars, nations rising up against nations and kingdom against kingdoms. He said that in verse 6 and 7. He said that there's going to be famines, famines, fam I can just, famines that's going to happen, destruction of the food supply, that there's going to be diseases in various places, pestilence, and there would be devastating earthquakes. Now, many times people will come up and say, Brad, did you see about the earthquake or did you hear this is happening? You know what I mean? Well, Jesus said, these are the beginning of sorrows. And the sorrows was a word, if you remember, was birth pains. And in other words, like, like a baby is going to be coming out and mom is getting ready. And then all of a sudden, man, the water breaks or something happens and they start coming more frequently and more what? Intense. And he says, hey, guys. You're gonna, these things are going to happen more frequently and more intense. But they're not going to stop. He then continued in verse 9. He said, Christians are going to be hated and persecuted by all nations. Verse 10 we talked about last week. People will be easily offended. And how easily are people offended? The whole cancel culture, polarization that we have. We can't even talk and agreeably agree to disagree. And the Christians will be hated worldwide. 
Verse 11 said that you'd be deceived by false prophets. That lawlessness, verse 12, and perversion would abound, resulting in the love of many growing colder and colder, and that's what's happening to this world. It's becoming a very cold, cold place. And then verse 14, it said the gospel would be preached to all the world. So those are things that are going to happen, but you've got to realize the takeaway through all that is Jesus is saying that see that you are not troubled. He says we need to hold fast, absolutely, to endure, right? Hold on to our faith in these trying times. As we see that we are living in these last days before the return of Jesus Christ, that we keep our eyes upward on the throne, on the Lord, realizing he's got things under control. Because if you keep your eyes here, man, you can get really, really bummed out. Well, now he's going to point out to a sign called the abomination of desolation. That is the sign above all signs pointing to his second return here to establish his kingdom. And that's going to be the focus, verse 15. But I'm going to read verse 15 all the way through 21 this morning. It says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. So we're gonna, that's going to be our focus this morning, that you understand. We're going to read it, and I want you to what? Understand it. He who reads, let him understand. And he's going to tell these four disciples that when you see this happening, what are you supposed to do? Verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field, don't you go back and even get your clothes. Why? But woe to those if you're pregnant and to those if you're nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Jesus is saying when we're going to talk about this thing called the abomination of desolation. When you see this happening, it's a big deal. When you see that happening, you are to take off. Now, it's really clear he's focusing, talking about the Jewish people, because it says, if you are in Judea, that's where, in Israel, what? You're supposed to flee, take off, go to the mountains. If you're on the top of your house, take off. We don't hang out on the top of our houses, but they're in Israel. They have flats on top, and they did. Don't even go down. Leave. Pray that it doesn't occur on the Sabbath day. Now, Saturday, we don't celebrate the Sabbath. We have church on Sunday, but the Sabbath has rules attached to it. You can only go so far. And if you're being this legalistic person, what are you supposed to do now if I have to flee? And then Jesus said, verse 21, and after all this happens, after the abomination of desolation, then there will be a great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world unto this time, no, nor shall ever be. He tells us his close disciples. That as you look into the book of Daniel at the passage, or there's actually three passages dealing with the abomination of desolation, to read it and to understand it. When you see this abomination occurring in a holy place, in the holy temple, well, question, is there a temple existing in Israel now? No. And that's key for us to understanding in this, this passage. So there's Going to have to be a third temple built. When you see this abomination occurring in the Holy of Holies, the holy place of the temple, Jewish people, you better take off and flee. And it's going to get so bad that Jesus calls this time the Great Tribulation. So back to verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, and you guys just read it, let him understand. So I want you to what? Understand it. And that's my desire for you guys to get this morning. See, this is the sign above all signs that points to Jesus' soon second return. And he tells us that this abomination of desolation is in the book of Daniel. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at this. And I said, I'm going to come back and we'll do a a deeper look at it. And that's what we're doing this morning. So look at verse uh, Daniel. If you want to flip there to Daniel 9.24, we'll be hitting a few verses there. It says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. We get locked up into this word weeks. It actually should read 77s, like 70 times 7. Well, 70 times 7, 490 seconds, 490 days, 490 weeks, 490 years. Most commentaries believe this has to do with 77s is 490 years. There's a period of 490 years in which God is going to be focusing on directly on the Jewish people, 
your people, and the holy city, Jerusalem. So here's a little overview. 70 weeks or 77s or 490 years is going to be a period of time where God is going to be focusing on. It's been determined to work with the Jewish people, and that's what you need to understand here. God's focus is going to be with the nation of Israel and specifically with the holy city, Jerusalem. Now, verse 25, 26, and 27 are all part of this whole uh, 490-week scenario. We're going to look at verse 25 in a second, but it talks about a period of 483 years, or 69 times 7 is 483. Then there's going to be an interval, which is called the church age, and that's going to be happening where God isn't dealing with the nation of Israel specifically. But then we get into a seven-year period. Do you guys know what the seven-year period is called? The what? The tribulation. The last three and a half is called what? The great tribulation. Good job. So this is verse 27, which is we'll kind of focus on. But I want to talk about 25 and 26. But stay up here a second. I want you to realize God's timepiece for these end days is not centered around America. It's centered around who? The nation of Israel. You know what I mean? Well, you know, this is happening in our country. Well, what's happening in Israel? What's going on in Israel is going to be my question. See, some people believe that the Christians replace uh, the Jewish people, uh, and that's not the truth of all. God has not finished dealing with Jewish people, nor with the city of Jerusalem. It's amazing how it's always in our news. We, the church, are actually grafted in with them as you would graft a wild branch into an existing tree. As Christians, guys, we are called to be pro-Israel and not anti-Semitic. The Word of God says clearly about the Jewish people, Zechariah 2.8, For he who touches you, Israel, touches the apple of his eye. That's pretty powerful. Psalm 121.4, Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. God's got his hand in everything that's happening with Israel. Genesis 12.3, I will bless those that bless you, and I will what? Curse those that curse you. And then Psalm 127 tells us we are commanded to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So always remember, the prophetic time clock of end times focuses on the Jewish people in the city of Israel. Well, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, comes, there will be sixty. There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks, or 483 years. Daniel got this prophecy from Gabriel that says, from the time, got to realize, Daniel is in captivity at this time in Babylon. He's not even in Israel. He's in Babylon. He was carried into captivity. And he was reading in the book of Jeremiah that these 70 years are about to come to pass. He's going to be returning home. The nation's going to be coming home. And, and Gabriel tells him that there's going to be a command to return and to rebuild Jerusalem. And from the time that that command actually goes out till the Messiah comes, the Prince of Peace is going to be 483 years. Well, what's amazing is about 100 years after the death of um, Daniel, King Artaxerxes gave a command for it to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in March 14th, 445 B.C. A hundred, excuse me, uh, 100, 400, 483 years later, 173,880 days after this command was given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, brings us to March 14th, excuse me, April 6th, 32 A.D. He gave the command in 445, and on 32 A.D., Jesus Christ actually entered in. There's going to be 483 from the command is given to go and forth to rebuild Jerusalem until what? The Messiah, the Christ, the Prince of Peace actually comes. That's when Jesus came in in the triumphant entry. He wept and he cried. He would have known this day, you know what I mean? But they didn't know. They missed it, totally missed it. In fact, rather than recognizing Jesus as their long-awaited Messiah, he was rejected and crucified. Well, Daniel 9.26 then says, after the 62 weeks of Messiah, he will be cut off, but not for himself. The Messiah was cut off. He was crucified, but he wasn't cut off for himself. He died for you and me. And the, pimple, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary. And we know that Titus and the destruction of the Jerusalem 
occurred in the temple. So here you see the 483 years was given from the command to go and and build Jerusalem till the Messiah, the Prince of Peace, came, and that came to the day. It then says that you were going to be cut off, and Jesus was for you and I. And then Titus came and invaded and destroyed the temple. And so for these 2,000 years that we've been alive, that's this whole area here, there's been no temple. That's called the church age here. I'm going to go back to the text that we're saying because we still have seven years, 480 years from 490 is seven years. We still have seven years that has not yet been fulfilled where God against is going to, going to return and focus back to Israel and the city of Jerusalem. Again, that seven-year period is called the tribulation. But the Lord doesn't leave us confused or in the dark about what's going to be happening. And that's our text this morning. Matthew 24, 15 says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation as spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Well, Daniel 9, 27 explains that this abomination of desolation is actually going to be occurring in the middle of the tribulation period. We read in Daniel 9, 27, Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. One week is how many years? Seven years. That's known as the seven-year tribulation. B, at the middle of the week, that's three and a half years, he, that's the Antichrist, shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering. That means the Antichrist will stop the Jews from offering their sacrifices. But but Brad, there's no temple. How can they offer sacrifices? That means the temple needs to be what? Built. And on the wings of abomination, that's the result of the Antichrist's abomination, shall be one who makes desolate. That means the people will be horrified and will flee until the complete destruction, the consummation, which is determined is poured out on the desolate. I believe that's going to be the Antichrist. So look at the first part, A. Then he, the Antichrist, will confirm a covenant with many for one week or seven years. This is called the seven-year tribulation. Does the Bible talk about the Antichrist throughout, at any other places? And what does it say? Well, Daniel, I just wrote these down so you can do your own study. We don't have time to do a deep study on all this, although it is somewhat deep here. Daniel 2, 42 to 43 tells us that the final world empire will be a 10-nation confederation, and it will be linked to the Roman Empire. 1 John 2, 18 says, it talks about the Antichrist. He will be one leading this empire. He's called the first beast, the Antichrist is called the first beast in Revelation 13. The Antichrist is called, as we're going to see today, the abomination of desolation in this chapter 9, also in 11 and 12 of Daniel. In 2 Thessalonians, he's called the man of sin and the man of lawlessness and perdition. He's called the little horn in Daniel 7 and 8. And he's also the rider of the first horse in Revelation 6. He's the first horseman of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. I believe the Antichrist is going to enter the scene at a very difficult time in the world. It could be involving a conflict between Israel and the surrounding nations in the Middle East and beyond. It could actually be the fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 and 39, which is the war of Gog and Magog. That means Russia is going to be coming down, Turkey is going to be coming down, Syria is going to be coming over, Libya is going to be coming up. That hasn't happened yet. Possibly when this whole thing occurs, one's going to rise up and make a covenant for 70 years with the nation of Israel, the surrounding nations. And when he does this, he's going to be hailed as the Messiah. And the seven years of the tribulation period will start with the false Messiah. He's going to be a man of peace, and he's going to be coming in on a white horse. And we read this in Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. See, the tribulation, seven-year tribulation period goes from chapter 6 all the way up into uh, chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. Chapter 4 and 5 is what's happening in heaven, and if you read it, the church is already in heaven. So chapter 6, we see that the Father gives the scroll to the Son, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, and Jesus will now open one seal upon the other as God's wrath starts coming down upon this world. Verse 1 says, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals and heard One of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, come and see. And I looked, 
And behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out to conquering, uh, you know, conquering and to conquer. So we see that the first seal is open and it starts with what could look like Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world coming on a white horse. But I'm telling you, it's not going to be. And here's, I want you to see why. Look at this horseman. He's white. He's coming on a white horse. He has a weapon. The weapon is a bow, but he doesn't have any arrows, which means he's probably coming in a time of peace, not threatening, a willingness to talk. He has a crown, but the word for the crown is Stephanos. And Stephanos is a crown that is given like if you were back then in the Olympics and you did the Olympics games, we give you a gold medal, right? Something. They would give him a Stephanos. It's something temporary that you would wear, showing something that you have earned, something that's been given to you by others. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Well, many people think, again, this is Jesus Christ. He's got a bow. He's got a crown. He's coming to save the day. But I say, nay, nay. I say this is the Antichrist, and you might say, why, Brad? Is he one of the four? No, there aren't four horses in the book of Revelation. There's actually five horses in the book of Revelation, and there's many others that we actually come and join. And I want you to see about this. See, Revelation 19 clearly gives you a picture of what Jesus will look like when he comes on a white horse. Verse 11 of Revelation 19 reads this, and this is a picture of Christ. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Oh, another white horse. Just like Revelation 6, it's got to be the same guy. That is the only similarity you're going to see here. And there's a reason why he will be able to deceive many. And he who sat on him is called faithful and true. That's Christ. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. That's his purpose. His eyes are like a flame of fire. That's a description that you can get from chapter 1 also. And on his head were many crowns. Now this word crowns is not Stephanos, like something was given to him. The word is diadema, which is a kingly ornament on the head, a crown. It depicts authority and a ruler that you have, not something that was given. He had a name written that no one knew except himself, and he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood. Totally different apparel. And his name was called what? the Word of God, which is obviously the name of Jesus Christ. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, that's you and I. We're already in heaven. Follow him on white horses. So he's now leading you and I when he comes back at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. Notice this a sharp sword sword, not a bow without arrows. It's not the same dude. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. That's his purpose. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of King and what? Lord of Lords. And he began to conquer over the earth, bringing the earth under his control, his sphere, and his power and control. So we see this is going to start the seven-year tribulation period when the first seal is broken. And the first horseman that comes riding in looks like the Messiah, the Christ. However, it's a counterfeit Jesus. It's a substitute Christ. It's an antichrist. But he's going to come in appearing like the Messiah, the Savior of the world. How can people be so deceived? Because Satan is in the business of what? Deception. That's what he does. He replicates certain aspects of the Savior. They're both on a white horse, and then people will want to embrace him. What was the first thing that Jesus told his four disciples? Be ye not deceived, for many will come in what? My name. Here we see the ultimate fulfillment of this. But the world's going to say, a Savior has arrived, a hero has arrived, and the Savior will solve our problems, bringing us peace. You know, for many years, I, there's been this whole thought that, you know, when, when the temple was destroyed, there's always been this, a remnant of, of Israelites living in Judea. It's been small, but it's been continuous over 2,000 years. And no one would ever think, how, how could this, how could a, something, an Antichrist, stand in the most holy place when there is no longer what? A temple. And a small little group of people could never build a temple. But then what happened in 1948? 
In 1948, they established an Israeli nation back in its land, and people came from all over the world and filled it up. This was actually a prophecy that was prophesied called the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37. Well, now is it possible with all these people there in that land to build a temple? Is anything being done to build a temple? Do any people, people even there want to build a temple? The answer is yes. Almost five years ago, when we as a church went over and a bunch of us to the um, Jewish quarter in the Jerusalem Old City, we visited a place called the Temple Institute. You may want to write that down in your notes, the Temple Institute. And they are, they are committed to rebuilding the temple. Well, yesterday I got on their website and I started seeing where are they at? And they have this video. It's about six minutes long, but it's powerful on what's happening today. I'm Yitzhak Rubin, I'm the director, I'm the director of, the of the International Department of the Temple of the Institute. Institute. Today, Today our goal today more than ever, ever is to reach out to the world and to spread, to spread awareness, awareness about the Holy about Temple, the potential and the beauty, and beauty that it holds for the entire world. world. Now I'm going, now to, I'm going introduce to introduce you to the people who make this happen. I'm Azariya Azariel, I'm a member of the Torani Institute. Before two years, they came to the Temple with five and a half stars, and they saw that they were dark, dark, without any stars, or כעת, אחרי שהפירות כבר, פה אנחנו, יש לנו עוד הרבה הכנות לעשות, למצוא את המקום המתאים, וצריך להיות מול מקום המקדש, צריך להיות עם כהן, שהוא בעצמו טהור. רק בעזרת הפרה אדומה, נוכל להיחלץ מהטומאה, להיות טהורים לגמרי, ונוכל לגשת למצוות של המקדש, וגם תרומות ומעשרות, בצורה תקינה, כמו שהתורה מצאה. אני שמשן אלבוהן, ואחת הפעולות המשמעותיות שאני זוכר לעשות פה במסגרת המכון, זה מה ש... שנקרא תרגולי המקדש. אנחנו משחזרים מחדש את העבודה של בית המקדש בחגים. אנחנו זוכרים לעשות אותם היום ממש למרגלות הר הבית, ובאמת יוצאים מפה עם דרישת מקדש בלב. זה התרומה הגדולה של מכון המקדש לעניין המקדש. שמי אברהם כהנא, אני בעצמי כהן, רכשתי סט של בגדי כהונה כדי שנוכל... להיות מוכנים לבית המקדש. אנחנו עושים תרגולים מדי חג שמתקרב אלינו, אם זה קורבן פסח, ואם זה סוכות, ואם זה ניסוח המים, וגם אנחנו מתכוננים, כשנהיה מוכנים, להתחיל לעבוד בבית המקדש. שמי מנחם רוזנטל, הצטרפתי פה למכון לקדם יוזמות ופרויקטים חדשים, להקים את שירת הלוויים. העניין הזה נקום ונפעל למען כינון בית המקדש, לאסוף לוויים שבאים מכל קצוות הארץ, מהצפון עד הדרום, וללמוד ולשיר. זה לקום ולעשות מעשה שהם באמת מתכוננים לעמוד על הדוכן, לעמוד ולשרת. My name is Rafaela. One of the exciting projects in the making now is publishing a new book in English about the meaning behind the services in the Holy Temple. Now we go into a chapter of the vessels of the Holy Temple. We speak about the daily service, the offerings in the Holy Temple. Every offering has a different message that God is speaking to us through this offering and we are speaking to Him. This book has tremendous significance for the people of Israel and for the whole world. Shalom, I call Yoshua Friedman. Before a few years, the Mechon HaMikdash decided to build a large church, a special in our church, where we also learn the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit, where they are learning the Holy Spirit in the Holy Spirit. That is, every thing they learn is the Holy Spirit, so there is a great focus on how the things they need to do in the full moment, from the knowledge that we are going to do it with the Holy Spirit. Shalom, my name is Nathan Tzvi Brin. I'm a student, I mean, a Talmud at the Yeshiva HaMikdash. What's special about Yeshiva HaMikdash is that we learn really in order to do. My Rebbe is Rabbi Yeshua Friedman, and he drives us to think in a Geula mindset. We know that we have to mitkadem as much as we can to fulfill the mitzvahs that we're learning. We learn exactly those sugyas and practice them as if we're doing them, so that when the opportunity comes to really do it, we're ready to do it. Hey, I'm Yitzhak Sarid, I'm learning in Yeshiva HaMikdash. בישיבה אנחנו עוסקים בלימוד קודשים וטהרות, דברים שקשורים לבית המקדש ולחיים בזמן הגאולה. זה סדר שמדבר על הלב של עם ישראל, על המקדש שהוא זה שמזרים את הקדושה לתוך העולם. החזון שלי זה שבית המקדש שלנו יהיה מאות בחורים ואברכים 
ששוקדים יומם ולילה לפתח את התורה הענקית של בית המקדש, שבעזרת השם יביא לבניין המקדש במהרה, וזה כמובן החזון של כולנו. My name is Samara Hendrickson. I am the content manager for the online global community of the Temple Institute. Our department is responsible for the Holy Temple teachings that we put on our social media platforms. So the teachings are about the Holy Temple, even the minutest details in regards to the work that was done in the Holy Temple. Our mission is to reach everybody around the world and create one strong global community who are interested in learning about the importance of the Holy Temple. My Gilad Rothstein, I am the Mechon HaMikdash. Our goal is to move forward to the Temple of the Holy Temple in the Holy Temple. Now, our goal is to move forward to the Holy Temple. ציווי האלוקי ועשו לי מקדש ושכנתי בתוכם ובשביל לקיים את הנבואה ואת האמירה של הקדוש ברוך הוא שכי ביתי בתפילה יקרא לכל העמים. אנו רואים כבר היום שינוי גדול בתודעה הלאומית וברצון הלאומי להתקדם למקדש חייבים לבצע את המשימה בכל הכוח ולהתקדם לבניין הבית במהרה בימינו. שמי ישראל אריאל ולפני חמישים ושבע שנה זכינו להיכנס יחד עם הצנחנים שכבשו את הר הבית במקום המקדש. שם שרו, אמרו הלל, הייתה שמחה עצומה שהקיפה למעשה את כל כדור הארץ. עם ישראל זכה לנס הגדול לחזור למקום המקדש אחרי אלפיים שנים. אנחנו יודעים את המציאות כרגע, זאת המשימה, העם היהודי חייב לחזור למקדש, ורק כשעם ישראל יחזור לבית המקדש You know, I, I know that's all, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? You read that and you kind of go, these people are ready to go in now. I mean, they're, they're, they're out there getting their vessels together, their garments, they're practicing the whole uh, temple reenactment ceremony, Levitical uh, choir. Everything's getting ready to build the third temple on the Temple Mount, but they do have huge political and huge religious problems there. See, since the 7th century, the Temple Mount has been the home of two Islamic holy sites, the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Asq Mosque. So the world's going to need someone to come in and broker a deal if it's going to be built there on what? The Temple Mount. There's some other locations they think it might be, but if that is, they have a desire to build it on Mount Moriah, which they believe this is where it was. They need someone coming in on a white horse to save the day, to broker a seven-year covenant deal that will no doubt entail I think the rebuilding of the temple and to help Israel do that. See, the Jewish people want world peace and they will probably have the Messiah that they recognize be the one who will help them rebuild their temple. Amazing, Jesus said this in John 5, 43. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How pertinent is that today? See, when he comes in on the scene, the world's not going to get any better. Rather, it's going to go worse. See, God's going to be releasing his wrath during the first part <clears throat> of the tribulation as one seal is broken after another. After the first horseman, horseman comes in on a white horse, the Antichrist, ushering in a short time of world peace, negotiating a seven-year agreement, a covenant between Israel and its surrounding nations, things start to change. See, we continue to read right after the first horse. We read in Revelation 6, verse 3. Then he opened the second seal. I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery and red, went in, went out. And it was granted to the one who was set on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. And so the second horseman comes in, talking about this terrible time of wars and destruction that's going to be occurring. Verse 5, then he opened the third seal, and I heard a third living creature say, come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius. 
but do not harm the oil and the wine. Like all wars, these wars are going to yield a great time of famine, representing the third horseman riding in black, carrying a scale. Food shortages, food inflation, yielding starvation, malnutrition, and pestilence will occur. Verse 7, and then he opened the fourth seal, and I heard the voice of a fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name on him who sat on it was Death, and Hades followed him. And power was given them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. So we see this fourth horseman riding in a, on a pale or a green horse, death, an eternal Death and eternal damnation is going to be for those who do not have a relationship with Christ. One-fourth the world's population. We have 8 billion people. One-fourth of eight is what? Two billion people will be killed in this period of time. See, the Antichrist is going to go forth conquering and to conquer. But after three and a half years, everything's going to change. And that's back to Daniel 9.27. But in the middle of the week, in the middle of these seven years, in three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, will bring an end to the sacrifice. He's helped them rebuild this temple. They've been offering sacrifices, and now he's going to stop it. He's going to break this covenant, and he's going to set up what's called the abomination, which causes desolation, or the abomination of desolation, here in the middle of the seven-year period. Verse 27, last part. And on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate or causes horror, people to be horrified, even until the consummation, complete destruction, which is determined is poured out on the desolate. I believe that is the Antichrist that's going to be poured out on the very end. The vocabulary for the word abomination is something that's extremely offensive form of idolatry. It's an affront to the true worship of God. And he says that this form of idolatry is going to be standing in the holy place, desecrating it, making things desolate and empty. Second Thessalonians tells us what's going to happen, verse two, chapter 2, verse 3. Let no one deceive you, again, look at that deception, by any means, that the day will not come unless there's first a falling away comes first, and then the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, all different names for the Antichrist who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God and that is worship, that's called idolatry. He's, he's lifting himself up. So that he sits as God in where? The temple of God, showing himself that he's God. He now is the abomination of desolation. It is actually the Antichrist declaring himself to be God, that he is God. And as a result, people are going to be horrified they're going to run. They're going to take off. Well, what's going to actually happen? Revelation 13 tells us this, because this is now going to be going into what's called the great tribulation that's going to be happening. Again, three and a half years is the mark of the abomination that causes desolation. And then the last three and a half, Jesus called the what? Great tribulation. Well, what's going to be happening? We'll hit that all next week, but here's just a preview. Revelation 13, 11. There are two beasts One's called the first beast, which is the Antichrist. And then you have this sidekick who's called the second beast. That's the false prophet. So let me explain this to you when we read this. Verse 11, then I saw another beast. That's the second beast, the false prophet coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. He looks like Jesus, but he speaks for Satan. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast, that's the Antichrist, in his presence and causes the earth and all those who dwell in it to what? Worship the first beast. That's the Antichrist whose deadly wound was healed. The Antichrist is going to appear to be dead, but he's going to rise from the dead. Thought he was killed with the sword, but he wasn't. Then he, the false prophet, will perform great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And then he, the false prophet, what, what does false prophets do? They deceive those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, the Antichrist, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast that was wounded by the sword and lived. Look at verse 15. And he was granted power 
to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many that would not worship the image of the beast to what? To be killed. See, that's the horrific thing that's going to make them want to take off. Remember, he says, those of you in Judea, what? Flee, take off, because they're going to see this happening here. We'll pick that up next week. But the point I want to make is this image is also made of the Antichrist. And technologically, this image or the statue or whatever it is will have the ability to speak and to kill. And so they're going to be there in the third Jewish temple. And when people see that, take off. If you don't choose to worship the image, you're going to be killed. Now that's something to be worried about. That's something to make you want to run. So back to the text now, Matthew 24, 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Well, we read it. Hopefully we understand what it's going to be. If you didn't understand all of it, breathe, it's okay. It's a lot of information there. I got it, right? A lot of information there. But my question is, he said to these four disciples, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, did those four disciples see the abomination that causes desolation in the holy place? They never actually, never, they weren't physically there. It hasn't been done yet. Well, some people say, well, maybe Titus, when he, when he destroyed the temple, that was it. No, that's not it. Because Greater things has happened since the destruction of that. I mean, gr there'll be a great tribulation following that whole situation, and it's only going to be for three and a half years. So then, if it's not the disciples, why would Jesus tell them when you see this? Well, the answer is because they asked him a question. What's going to be the end of the age? What's going to be the signs? And he's telling them, hey, when you see this, when you see this, just like, you know what I mean? When you go down, you make a right here, you make a left there. He's just giving them an answer that we would want to know. It's important for them to understand what's going to happen at the end of the age. And if it's important for those four disciples to know what's going to happen at the end of the age, how much more is it important for you and I to know at the end of the age? Now, those of us that know Christ will never see the abomination that causes desolation because we're going to be raptured prior to this seven-year period. But God wants us to know so we can share with people, share our faith with people. Guys, we are living, I think, in the most incredible time of history. What we have access to, we know exactly what has happened. We know where we are today with the signs of the time as we look at things, and we know what's going to happen in the future. What an opportunity we can share with people from this area that we have. Share our faith and the important the clarity. People are looking for hope. You're not going to find any hope in this world. The only hope you're going to find is in Jesus Christ, our Savior. But I think it's also written that if you don't know the Lord and Christ comes and takes his church, and then all of a sudden... You've heard of the Bible, if you read the Bible, or you pick up this tape, or some of the te teaching tapes, and you go, man, there's a guy now who is declaring himself to be God. You have time to turn to the Lord. You have time to come to Christ. They're going to see everything happening. And from the time that he is declared uh, to, to, to be God in the, in the uh, middle of the temple, you now have three and a half years until Jesus Christ returns. Our hope would be that they would pick up a Bible and read it and turn to Christ. And my hope for us is that we would be boldly sharing with people because the time is near. When you see that video and you see them ready to go tomorrow, you know what I mean? And, and people make a big deal about the red heifers, the red heifers, and I, 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 that's great. The red heifers is necessary to, to make some ashes for a ceremonial cleansing of the, of the different priests is what it is. Don't know when it's going to start, but I don't, we're definitely not going to have to worry about that. But it's exciting when you see this time of approaching. We're going to continue, and he's going to say, those of you, get ready, take off. Because in a great tribulation, and that's what we'll be talking about next week, okay? Let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord. I, I pray for, Lord, I'm glad I hope it's not in you. If there's anyone here who's never said, Lord Jesus Christ, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I, I want you to ask you into my heart. I, I want to be saved from this period of time that really could happen soon, immediately. Lord, I just pray that they would just receive you. Is there anyone here that would like to say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior? Lift up your hand. If you're watching on live, say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I realize you died for my sins. But I think there's a lot of people here 
Lord, maybe we need more boldness to share the truth as we see the time is near. Maybe some of us are just going through some difficult time, some heartbreak or some relationships problem or some financial problems or just communication problems. Or maybe you're just discouraged. Maybe you're having a lapse in your faith. I'm not too sure what it is, but before you leave, you want us to pray for you. Lift up your hand if that's you. Father, you see these hands lifted up, Lord. You see the needs that people have, God. Father, we come to you. Increase our faith. Give us the boldness to share. I pray for those that are having a difficult time, Lord, you comfort them, Father. For those that, that, that need more faith, increase their faith, Father. For those that are sick, Lord, you touch and heal, Lord. And Father, I want to pray a special prayer for those that are being baptized this morning, Lord. Those that are saying, I want a proclamation to everyone that I have died to my selfish life and I want to live for Jesus and I want everyone to know it, Lord. Father, increase the boldness for people to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.